The midway point of the NBA season is here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scorers and threes drained. I love mixing it up by betting against the spread, taking the over on Giannis's points every chance I get, and more exclusive bets like the two by three, two threes scored in the first three minutes. Plus FanDuel even lets you combine bets like those for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash blue wire. That's fanduel.com slash blue wire to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. 21 plus in select states. First online real money wager only. Bonus issued as non-withdrawable free bets that expires in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG in New Jersey. Hey everyone, welcome to The Final Four is Not in the Schedule. I'm your host Eric, alongside with expert analyst Rod. Thanks for joining us on the best MSU basketball podcast featuring an in-depth recruiting, game matchup, and post-game analysis. We dive deep to give you the best tools to enjoy the Spartans and impress your friends and family. Hey everybody, it's Eric alongside Rod and our special guest, retired assistant basketball coach, Mike Garland. Uh, We're going to be talking about Michigan State's 112-106 112-106 loss to the Iowa Hawkeyes in overtime today in Iowa City. Uh, just a meltdown at the very end of the game, a very disappointing. Uh, before we begin, I just wanted to remind you that if you have gutter work you need done, obviously go check out the gutters at Just Do Gutters. They do great work if you're on the west side of the state. Talk to Kurt Stauffer and his team. Uh, they support the show, so we love it when you guys support our sponsors. You can contact me at kurt.stauffer at brothersgutters.com. That will be linked on the podcast notes, and so you can get a hold of it, him there. He'll give you 10% off if you use Final Four in your email. They do gutter cleaning, install, and repair. Uh, so we'll begin here with Michigan State. They had a, I mean, this is a game where it's kind of hard to explain, I guess, a way. A game where it was 15, 13 points, I think, with a, like a less than two minutes to go. And Michigan State hit a bunch of free throws, but Iowa just got suddenly super hot from three. They hit threes that, you know, were guarded, some that weren't. Michigan State had a turnover two, missed only a few free throws, but just enough to give Iowa an opportunity to tie the game, to send it into overtime. Uh, And then Iowa just continued that shooting and that pace in the overtime. And I think, you know, Michigan State at that point has sort of been thrown out of sorts. Um Really great games from individually from Tyson Walker, uh, for Jaden Akins, and um, I don't know. It's a it's a hard game to sort of comprehend because it was, uh, for all intents and purposes, I thought it was over. I think the the team thought it was over. They were almost kind of joking around on the court because you know Akins missed a free throw, which turned out to be an important free throw. You know, with like a one and a half minutes left, uh, and I uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'll turn it over to you, <laughs> Coach, in your in your impression sort of of the game and sort of. I know. I mean, overall, I think Michigan State played pretty well. Shot the lights out. I mean, they shot. Well, they were shooting eighty-five percent or so from three to finish the game, and on decent volume, hitting eleven of thirteen. But uh, just not quite enough when it comes down to the end of it, I guess. Well, yes, and uh, you know, we played a heck of a game really up until the last forty seconds of that of that ball game. We were up ten points with forty seconds to go, and uh, a couple of missed switches. Um, you know, typically when we play uh, under five minutes, we're switching five. That means no matter what, no matter the size, we're switching five to take away threes. And a couple of blown communications and, you know, loss of focus as to what we were doing. Now they hit big shots. You give them space. They're at home. They're typically a better three-point shooting team at home than they are on the road. And, um, and, and this is what happens. But if let, let's go back in the game. If we go back in the game, 
there was a free throw situation where they missed the first free throw and then they missed the second. We didn't cut out or block out and mm -hmm. they got yep. the rebound and score. Then they were, then in their efforts to get back in the ball game, they missed a couple of threes. Yep. And on every single account, yep. they were able to get the they were able to get the rebound and get a second shot where they scored one. So, you know, these little small things, especially this time of year, are very vital that you get them done. Yeah, you got to close out the possessions, right? I I was gonna. I was just gonna say. Um, you know, it was it was interesting watching Michigan State in the second half. They they pretty much played small. That they came out of the out of halftime small, and that was a. I, I don't know if that was a sort of a reflect of trying to stop Robracha, who punished him quite quite well down down uh, down low initially, uh, and it seemed to work for most of the half. And then sort of, a, I don't know. I mean, I, were you surprised by that by that strategic move by by Izzo? Uh, no, not really. No, not really, because um, once Malik went in and started gardening, he struggled. You know, he, he wasn't able to to score uh, the same way that he was scoring when we had a bigger player on him. And I think the reason for that is, you know, he's a little quicker. Um, you know, he's a 25 year old, fifth year player and he, his experience took over. But um, I'm going to say this, and this scared me before the game. When we played them in East Lansing, he, um, he, had, a, he, had, a, he had a great game there. And um, <clears throat> what happens, too, is that, you know, the ball goes inside, and it goes inside, and then everybody starts to squeeze down on that post. And when you start squeezing down at a post, you're a step slow getting back on the closeout to the shooter. And um, he kind of established that. And you can see different times in the game where, <clears throat> you know, instead of us, you know, defending in that post one-on-one, -on -one, even with those guards, we started trying to dig down and leave those shooters open. And you just couldn't do that. You know, we're trading, we're trading twos for threes. We'd have been better off if they would have scored in the post and then we go back down and score again or go to the foul line. We weren't missing. So, you know, there's a number of, of, of critical mistakes that we made. Um, Coach, I, I want to ask you about that last possession Iowa had after, after AJ's missed free throw in regulation, the one they hit to tie it. Um, it's a scramble situation, obviously, so it's not ideal. But I, I'm positive there's going to be talk from the fans and, and probably from the media as to why we didn't MSU foul. not fouling. Exactly. What do, you, what do you think about how that unfolded and kind of philosophically where you sit in that kind of situation? Rob, we don't foul. We've never done it. We don't foul. I, in that and everybody has their philosophies on that every coach in the nation has a different philosophy as to what to do on that and we don't foul and uh, I know why because on that same play that you're talking about had 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 joy and and Tyson switched the way they were supposed to right that shot tested off balance three and he don't he doesn't make that shot right but at the end of the game, we couldn't, I don't know what was going on. We wouldn't switch. And yeah. uh, that there, there was, there was, you know, that hurt us. One thing was um, the guy off the ball, uh, the guy off that ball, off the ball was sinking more than one step off the line of the ball. If you understand what I'm saying, when you're one pass away, you should only yep. be one step off the line of the ball for the next pass. And a couple of times guys were like two and three steps. So now my man comes over and we're supposed to switch, but I don't see you anywhere there because you're so deep. So I just kind of stay with the guy. And then 
we both go to the same guy and the guy's wide open to score. Yeah. I, I think the other thing too, that the people screaming for a foul in that situation also forget if, if I recall correctly, he took the shot with maybe just under five seconds left. So it wasn't as if the game was over. Iowa would have fouled immediately. You got to go back to the line and hit them. And even if you do hit them both, you're still in a one possession game. They've still got a chance. So it's not like that would have killed it off. The other thing too, I think about is if you foul him and he happens to miss a free throw with the way Michigan state was defensive rebounding, who's to say Iowa doesn't come up with it. (laughs) You know, absolutely. I, I totally agree. And that's why we did. And that's why we didn't put ourselves in that position. We needed to, def- we needed to play defense right. the way we the way Michigan State plays defense. You know, we, we switch. Um, we just lost focus as to what we should be doing again. Why didn't we switch? I mean, I could ask that question. We'd have to ask that question a million times and we did it more than once. Yeah. Uh, so let's go back a little bit to the when things were going better with Michigan State. And Michigan State's offense was playing great, uh, you know, getting lots of open looks and, um, you know, cutting well, getting around screens. And, I mean, everyone was shooting the lights out. I mean, this is, you know, you always have games where you have open looks like this, but to make most of them like this, it was impressive offensive performance. Is that is that a reflection just the Michigan State's focus as much, or was it more Iowa just not really putting up much resistance and, it, and making it almost you very comfortable in your offensive flow? Well, I was not a <clears throat> I was not a great defensive team, as you guys well know, and um, we were getting open shots, and um, they really had no no answer for Tyson. Uh, we were getting every shot that we wanted to get, and. Uh, you know, once players get in a groove the way we did today, they're going to make shots. But the danger in that lies in the fact that guys get going and they're so in tune to their offensive play that the effort on the other end becomes, you know, not what it should be. You get you get caught up in a shootout, right? Yeah. Absolutely. You make one, I make one, and it affects exactly. the mentality. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I, I wanted to ask you about what what you thought about the the overtime and specifically Michigan State's offense. I just felt that, and maybe it was because they didn't take a, a field goal attempt for the last three minutes, almost of regulation, that they had gotten out of <laughs> whack, but. I just felt like the movement was really sluggish. It didn't look like everybody was on the same page and what they were running. Is that what, is that what you saw? It just looked disorganized. Well, you know, what happened, as you said, we, we, we didn't, we didn't even take a field goal during that, during that last three minutes. And now we're in overtime and I was afraid that that was going to happen that we would have to try to get ourselves going offensively again. Um, And, and sure enough, we were out of sync. You know, we tried to, um, we tried to, to run the single double stuff that we run for Tyson and, you know, they're, they're overplaying him and turning down, turning him down. So, so that he can't come off those staggers. And um, at that point, they did do a decent job. But the biggest problem was we couldn't, we, you know, we, we were trying to pull that light switch back on and we couldn't. Yeah. It's very surprising to hit 11 of 15 from three, 31 of 36 from the line and end up losing a game. Right. I mean, but it's, you know, Iowa hit 17 threes, 36 attempts. And so, and a, lo- a lot of those were late, but you know, they, Iowa still was getting up quite a few early and. I don't know. I mean, they're just a different team at home than they are on the road. I've my wife's a hockey fan. As people listen to the show know, and right. so she was, um, you know, so she, we watch all their games, and so they are, you know, it's night and day how they are. Um, w- with the offensive rebounding problems, was that a reflection a little bit of the fact that we were a little bit small at the end, or is that just like an effort sort of thing, or what do you th- what do you describe the the problem with the def- clearing up the defensive boards and I would just, you know, punishing us. Well, we, 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 we kept getting caught. <clears throat> we kept getting caught with our guards, you know, down low. Uh, yeah. 
um, their guards were, you know, their guards were actually um, getting inside position on our guy, on our smaller guys and getting the offensive rebounds for putbacks or to throw it back out, you know, for an open three. And um, yeah, I have to agree that it, it hurt us in a lot of ways, but then if we don't go small, um, if we don't go small, then we have nobody to really guard those threes because they were somewhat small too. Because at that point, Chris Murray was playing the five. Right. So we, you can't have Matt, Matty Sissoko or, or Jackson Kohler uh, in there trying to guard him out on the perimeter. He's, he's too good with the ball and, you know, he, he's going to get that shot off. So that was the right thing to do. What happens in that is that when the shot goes up, our bigs at that time were Joey and Malik. They have to go back and help pursue the ball. It's a team rebound. It's a gang rebound, as we refer to it. It's a gang rebound. You have to now rebound the ball with five guys. And a lot of times, you saw, you guys saw it. It was just one guy under that rim by itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I mean, when Tony Perkins is the guy right. killing you on the offensive boards, that's not because you went small. I was small, too, out there. Exactly. So exactly. it's not like it was Robracha doing the damage. So I, no. I just can't buy that as an excuse that it was just it was a right. poor performance by MSU, as I saw it, you right. know, particularly on the glass. Yeah. Know. The switch, the switching, the, our, our switching and, you know, our, our lack of attention or our lack of uh, rebounding just killed us. Yeah, because, I, I mean, as we know, they needed one stop. That's all they needed down the stretch. Yeah. One miss and one defensive rebound and the right. game is over right. and they right. couldn't get it. Iowa, even when Iowa missed, right. they would still score on the possession. Exactly, because yeah. they would get the offensive rebound. Yeah. You know, you get, you get, like you said, we get one of those and the game is over. Yeah. One, because at that point we, they're going to foul and we we're going to go to foul line and make our free throws or we were just, we were going to score. Can I ask, ask your, uh, your opinion on, on that issue in a, in a broader sense. Cause we talk about it a lot on the podcast one thing over the course of the season that this team has been better at than the last couple of years is defensive rebounding over the course of the whole season. But we've seen these games pop up, you know, the Rutgers game at home where somehow MSU still won comfortably, despite giving up 18 offensive rebounds. We had the Michigan game where in Ann Arbor, where I think it's what cost them the game. Uh, was offensive rebounding it, kind of similar to this one, an inability to get a defensive rebound late. And then today, uh, what, what do you attribute that to that, that kind of, I, I, I don't even want to call it inconsistency because for the most part of the season, they've been, I mean, they were a top 50 team coming into today in defensive rebounding nationally. That's pretty good. Um, what do you attribute that to? Just, just in, in my mind, just a lack of focus to rebound the basketball. You know, uh, again, I'll allude to the fact when guys start making shots, they, in their minds, they begin to think that their shot is going to make up for a world of right. hurt. Had we be, been behind like Iowa was or the game had been closer, then we would have probably, you know, we would have probably had a, a lot more focus on rebounding the basketball. And when you see us not rebound well, particularly on the defensive on the defensive end, we're not. That's a that's a great indication that we're not rebounding as a unit. We're not gang rebounding the ball. And when that happens, <clears throat> that happens. You, when it, when that happens, you can now you you've got guys under the rim, you got guys around the rim, and you can also you can also rebound a long rebound out there 
um, after they're shooting those threes. But we just, for whatever reason, we relaxed when the shot went up and they decided to attack the glass and get the ball back. Well, why don't we go to uh, review the keys of the game and we'll be back in just a moment. Whether you're home or away, stay connected to your team with T-Mobile, the network that covers 99% of people in America. They've been investing billions to light up their best network ever. From your backyard to a sold-out stadium, get T-Mobile's best coverage yet. Plus, with T-Mobile, you get a price lock guarantee, so they won't raise the rate of your talk, text, and data ever. There's never been a better time to switch. Visit your local T-Mobile store today. Coverage not available in some areas. Price lock exclusions like taxes, fees, select promos, and third-party services apply. See T-Mobile.com. So the five keys of the game brought to you by Nudge Printing. Uh, Nudge Printing, you can go get our gear and support our show. You can find that at our website at thefinalforcenottheschedule.com slash merchandise. You get a sweatshirt just like what I've got here. Super comfortable, soft, very wearable, and uh, it's great. The Gaben is... My wife, Brittany, are MSU alums. They run the great operation out of Portland, Michigan. Vintage gear, all kinds of things as far as shirts and hoodies and decals. So check them out. You can get 20% off at checkout by entering Final Four as a coupon code. So the keys to the game, the number one key was Chris Murray, who I think, you know, for the first half, Michigan State did a very good job of limiting his attempts. They pretty much neutralized him. And even... Really, through most of the second half, I don't think he did much of anything until like the last, I don't know, five, six minutes, and he started getting going. And um, so, I don't know. I mean, overall, pretty good performance until the end, which I guess, you know, that's all that matters. And in the end, he ended up with 11, uh, 19 field goal attempts, which is much more than he had when he was in East Lansing. We'll talk about So, the next is defensive rebounding. I hate to even talk about this. Michigan State... <laughs> Uh, gave up 40.5% offensive rebounding percentage to Iowa. They had, Iowa had 15 Oof. offensive rebounds. Tony Perkins with five, as you mentioned before. Uh, the, one of the smallest guys in the court for Iowa. And Michigan State was only, on the other end, was only you know 18%. Uh, they got out-rebounded 34-30. to 30. Uh, You know, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what more to say there except that Michigan State just didn't show up. Do you have anything to add, Coach or Rod? Yeah, I mean, the, the, we've we've been talking about it for most of this most of this episode, and you know, I I I agree a hundred percent with with coach. It, some people are going to talk about AJ Hogard missing that free throw late, and yeah, you you want him to hit that, but Michigan State went five for six, I think, in the last forty seconds at right. the line. Yeah. That that's that should be good enough when you're working right. with a lead. You know, the three point shooting by Iowa. Yeah, they got hot, you know, and and sometimes that happens. That team in that building, we know that can happen. But to me, the inability to get a defensive rebound when you just needed one and you couldn't get one. That's that to me. And even in the overtime, that was that was showing up. But Perkins had a put back in the overtime that I think took the lead from three to five and really put MSU under pressure because now it's a two possession game. And they never really recovered from that. So, yeah, to me, that is the big story that might get ignored by a lot of people who are focused on the threes that Iowa hit and MSU missing a free throw. And, you know, the couple of turnovers MSU uh, had didn't help either. But um, to me, defensive rebounding is the story of this game above all else, in my opinion. And let me say something to that. When you when you're offensive rebounding basketball, the best three point shots that you can shoot in the game are inside out because it's just like it, it takes a kid back to when he sh- was out on the playground and somebody was standing on the rim feeding him or he's in his driveway and his dad is throwing the ball straight ahead to him. That for for a three point shooter, even even a, a average to poor three point shooter, the per, the percentages of making that shot go up significantly from inside out, as opposed to hitting them on the wing or or up top, you know, uh, person to person up top, you know, and it's it it changes everything. You know, them getting them offensive rebounds, you know, I mean, for years, <laughs> they did to us today what for years yep. we did 
other teams. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that definitely helps to be squared up right right when you're giving the, Absolutely. You're giving the pass. Absolutely. Right, yeah. So next key of the game we had was threes. And so that was something Mish say to, I mean, they're fantastic today uh, and good volume. You know, you hit 11 to 15 or sorry. Yeah. You hit um, 11, 15, they 11, 13 before they got to the overtime uh, period. And so that was, you know, 80 some percent and that's should be more than enough to win a game. Uh, but of course they did not limit Iowa's three point attempts and Iowa, even the first half, they didn't hit a lot. Well, they what well, they hit maybe five in the first half. I can't remember exactly, but they had a they had a lot large volume even then. Maybe they're like six to seventeen or something like that in the first half. So even then, Michigan State really wasn't limiting their threes. They just weren't hitting and connecting on a lot of them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and, yeah. and and if you and if you take a look and if you take a look or think about that first half, you know, because we weren't caught in a scramble because we were rebounding the ball better then we were there to contest those shots and it, it 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 made it a lot more difficult for them but when we're not <laughs> rebounding the ball and they're in the office rebound they're getting the office rebound it puts us in a scramble and now everybody's confused and then they swing swing the ball and now there's a guy standing wide open or a guy is getting a shot in a rhythm to make the shot. Yeah. And that's, I, I guess on that, on that last point, I mean, I think it might be worth mentioning, you know, it's always been a big strength for Michigan state over the years, ball movement, you know, swinging the ball from side to side, finding the open man. That is something that Iowa also traditionally does very, very well. So you talking about when your defense is out of sorts, because you're scrambling to recover to guys. Iowa's probably one of the last teams you want to be playing against when that's happening, because that is a part of the game they've, they've generally excelled in for a long time. You're, you're absolutely right. And the key to great offense is to, <clears throat> is to get the defense in rotation and where they're scrambling. And then you can, you know, you're going to have open shots or you're going to have long closeouts and guys are going to shot fake and go around you. Um, it becomes very difficult to guard the ball. And, you know, now that guy on the weak side, once that ball is swung, that guy gets around uh, the guy closing out. Then another guy has to help. He kicks, kicks it back around. And that guy is the guy on the strong, where the ball started out on the strong side is now wide open. As the as the strong side becomes the weak side, so yeah, that's that's what happens. So the fourth key to the game we had was guard play. Uh, you know, I mean, I thought I thought Hogard was yeah, not great the first half of the first half, maybe, and then he sort of got a he seemed to get a little bit more focus. He had a number of turnovers early on. He finished with four turnovers, seven assists. Walker, of course, sensational. Five assists, no, uh, two turnovers, 31 points, you know, seven of eight from the line, two of three from three, 11, 15 from the field. And, so and, I think and Jade Nakins. Guard players better. And Jade Nakins with what, 21? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious what, uh, Coach, what you thought of AJ's overall floor game today in this one. Well, I thought that I, I thought he did a nice job. And uh, for him, it's not so much. Uh, how much he scores is how right. he distributes the ball. And uh, you go back in that game, he made some phenomenal plays to, you know, to get guys open shots. Um, you know, I, I can't, I can't fault him for that. I mean, his floor game was to me was, was very good. Um, I don't know much more he could have done in that situation offensively. But it comes back to it as much as <laughs> as much as we're searching for something else. It just comes back to, you know, um, off the, um, giving up offensive rebounds and uh, not defending the three. Yeah, and finally turnovers. Michigan State, you know, for as well as they're shooting the first half, the only time that we're, they were stopped is when they stopped themselves. Oftentimes, a number of those unforced errors. Uh, they, you know, Iowa poked out a couple of balls a few times, but. Uh, the turnovers were a problem is certainly the end. You know, again, we're talking about one play. We're talking about one free throw, 
one defensive stop, one defensive rebound, one turnover is the difference from winning and losing this game uh, today. And so not a huge discrepancy, 15 to nine, but I think it was, well, it was obviously enough a difference to, to um, keep Iowa in the game in contact so they could pull it out at the very end. I, I, have, a, I have a question on that I'd like to ask coach. That travel they called on Malik late. Did you think that was a walk? Um, no, I didn't. But yeah, I, I didn't. Did, I didn't either. <laughs> I, but I did think it, that it was going to be called because it looked it looked like it was a travel, you know. But I I no, it wasn't traveling. It was, it was a bad call. I uh, and I believe that was Kelly Pfeiffer that called it. Um, right and. I, I, I have to admit, I, my mind went back to that weird stare down between <laughs> Fran McCaffrey and, and him, which I don't think uh, Robbie Hummel said he'd never seen anything like it. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it. Um, especially when they stepped to each other after the stare down was going for a while and they each took kind of a step in very right. strange, but I wondered, boy, did he buy himself a call? I mean, these guys are human and we know that that stuff happens. Uh, but I, yeah, I'm with you. I didn't, I didn't love that call. I know that, uh, I know that Kelly, uh, did make that call on the leak, but I, I disagree with you son, Rob, because he, I thought that Kelly kind of, I thought that Kelly kind of got back at him on that call where AJ stepped out of bounds. <laughs> okay, so you thought he was out of bounds. Yeah, I, I did. I thought his foot was right there. I mean, Perkins nudged him a, a tad, but I thought he was out of bounds. I mean, his, his foot was way out ahead of him. So you didn't I, think it was a foul is what it um, comes down to. Yeah, I thought, I thought that he – if he did foul him, it was it was after his foot. Was okay. Out. <laughs> okay. So one of the um, keys that we did not have in the game, but that I had asked you ahead of time, if you could give us something to look for, when it, and this is more you know a strategic sort of thing, and we took look at Iowa has their last in defense in the in the league, which is not surprising. This has been an, an, an abysmal defensive uh, mm -hmm. team for Fran McCaffrey, one of his worst. Uh, and you, you point out that one of the problems with their def defensive efficiency is actually not necessarily just them in the half court, but it's also on the offensive end. Can you can explain that a little bit more for our listeners? Yeah. What happens? Um, they have, they typically, they have poor shot selection. So yes, they don't average as many turnovers. Um, it appears that they're taking care of the ball. And their thought is, rather than turn the ball over, just get a shot off. Well, those bad shots in a, in a coach's mind, those count as turnovers. Because what's going to happen when you're taking contested bad three-point shots, you're out of rotation. So you're giving up layups and uncontested three-point shots or two-point shots every single time. So they don't, they, they put them, they, they put themselves out of position to cover because they're they're taking bad shots. Um, you know, <laughs> you know. It, as I said, you know, it appears that they're it appears that they're taking care of the ball, which they are to some degree. But those bad shots, it, you know, it put it, it puts their defense in jeopardy. Okay, so interesting. So by that. <laughs> We know Iowa typically doesn't run a lot of shot clock. So right. I guess what you're saying is they're taking shots early, which is going to hold down their turnover numbers because they're not possessing the ball for longer. They're not Absolutely. making more passes, Absolutely. reduces the chances you're going to turn the ball over if you're just putting up shots. Right. But, but if you're missing, <laughs> it's, it's right. still, it still equates to the same thing. It's still a change of possession, and you didn't get a good Absolutely. quality look on the offensive end. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was it, it, that that's been a, that was the philosophy of uh, Coach K at Duke. I mean, uh, for years uh, when we played them, uh, we would chart it. And anytime they went past three, three passes, 
they they would turn the ball over. Uh, and then typically, for the most part, it would be one pass in a shot or two passes in a shot. They 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 you know they didn't never move the ball enough to turn the ball over. And that was their philosophy. Well, you can get away with that when you had the kind of players that they had, <laughs> you know. But still, when things aren't going when things weren't going right right for them, they would typically lose the game. So you would say then a program like Wisconsin, which also every year tends to have low turnover numbers, but we know they run a lot of shot clock. That's a more honest kind of number than the one we see from Iowa in that way. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because they're taking care of the basketball they're moving the basketball and they're actually, you know, playing the shot clock out. So you have to give them credit for being able to do that. Right. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's amazing what they do without turning that ball over. Um, they're, they're, they're very good at doing it. And that's why they stay in ball games. You know, they're going to hang around, hang around, and hang around. And then if they get a 10-point lead on you, we've always said that if they get a 10-point lead on you, you might, they might as well be up on your 20. Right. Yeah, because you're just gonna not gonna get enough possessions to get no, back in it. Yeah, no, you're not gonna get enough possessions. You know, looking globally now, Michigan State falls to nine eight in the Big Ten. They are only have two games remaining. It looks like that Minnesota game is not going to get played. Hmm. Uh, I won't even ask you to sort of comment on on Rutgers' unwillingness to move their game and uh, the Big Ten being unable to to uh, force that rescheduling. Uh, so the season's not over. Obviously, there are two games that you really think Michigan State had an opportunity to win on the road. You had both Rutgers and now Iowa, the games that you know were there. And, and, and Michigan, too. And Michigan. Well, yeah, sure, Michigan. Yeah, Rod, right. I totally agree with Michigan. I mean, yeah, that, that game it was, was kind of like what happened here. About that. It just happened in regulation time. Yeah. I mean, yep, we had exactly. Yep. Yeah. What do you, are you a little surprised in the sense that, you know, we've, this is a veteran crew here for Michigan State. You've got Hauser and Hall and, uh, you know, Hogard and Walker. These are guys who you'd expect to be able to, you know, finish games, especially on the road in tough environments. That's kind of what sort of staple you expect with a, a veteran team. And they've, they, you know, they've won games on the road. So it's not like this is, they haven't been a pull off, but it seemed like this one was a little bit surprising. And, you know, the other two that you mentioned. Well, if you if you look at our car uh, play from the offensive <clears throat> from the offensive viewpoint, it was pretty good. Yeah, you know we were finishing the game. Our guards were finishing the game for us. Again, we didn't rebound or defend. Guard great guard play on the opposite end doesn't make up for that. You know, and uh, you would hope that they would miss a couple shots or this or that. But it's the Big Ten; it's <laughs> yeah. the most competitive conference in the nation, and it always it always has been and always will be. And guys just don't give you games. There's no gimme games. Uh, they were gonna win, lose, or draw. I was gonna play that game out to the to the clock went off, and they did. Yeah, I, I was I was actually thinking this uh, once it became clear that MSU was going to lose, that if there is ever a game to convince a coach, hey, keep fouling, keep extending the game, do everything you can, don't give in, uh, this would be the one. Uh, Perhaps. Yeah, and, and it worked. It worked it because worked. they made every play, and Michigan State just couldn't make quite enough to close it out. Nope, we couldn't make, you know, we couldn't get defensive stops. And uh, you just can't sit there and trade twos for threes. You can't do it. You're going to lose. Coming down the stretch, you're going to lose. Uh, let me let me ask you one, one more follow-up on all of this. Because, um, obviously, you've been in these locker rooms for forever, so you know better than any of us. Do you think that, it's likely that there's any kind of emotional hangover from this for these guys, or do you think it's something that they should be? Obviously, Coach Izzo has been doing this for forever as well. If anybody knows how to get a team off the mat, you would think it would be him. 
But what do you think? What do you think about that aspect of things? Like, how long does this linger? Is there a danger that it hangs over going into Lincoln later next week? Well, well you don't know until <clears throat> you really don't know until you play that game. Um, you know, you you can, <clears throat> you know, you can do everything you you can to prevent that from happening, but. Uh, what you're questioning in your mind as a coach, how did that game affect your team's confidence? Right. But see, especially when you lose a game that way, a game you had, I mean, 40 seconds to go, you're up 10, and then you lose the game. That's very, very damaging to your players. Very, very damaging. So, We'll know when they go into Lincoln uh, right away whether there's a hangover from that, and uh, if we if we if we if we have been able to sustain our confidence. In ter in terms of how MSU typically handles that, would would there be more of an emphasis on correcting the things that they did wrong? or more of an emphasis of trying to make sure that their confidence isn't shattered by what happened and emphasizing, Hey, we're good enough to win these games. We didn't close it out, but we're going to get the next one. Or is it a combination of the two things? No, you, you, I mean, I mean, I, I, you've just answered your own question. It has to be a combination of the two. You just can't say, Hey, I'm just gonna, we're just going to focus on our confidence and we're not going to worry right. about the mistakes we made because the mistakes we made were glaring. You don't even have to be uh, a basketball es expert or someone that watches a lot of basketball to see what, what, uh, what happened there. So you've got to address, you got to address both things. Yeah. So, you know, we talked about this, obviously the tragedy happened in Michigan state on uh, the 13th um, was there are no words to describe what happened. The players have been sort of playing through this. There are also students on campus. Mm -hmm. And so they live in that community. And so they're affected by that. Not something that you as a coach ever went through anything that's that specific sort of thing. But there have been obviously individual tragedies and problems that have happened to players and their families. Uh, you know, I don't know if 9-11 really affected your players back then when that occurred. You know, that was sort of a national sort of thing. What sort of things does the did you do as a coaching staff to help players get through those things? And, um, you know, is that as a team, is it individually or, you know, maybe I'm answering the question or is it some combination of both of those things to try and work those through? You know, of course, you know, uh, our players, um, you know, felt terrible about what happened uh, to, to those, to their classmates. But I'm going to say this, Eric, but we went through, when Cassius Winston's brother committed suicide, yeah. was more far reaching for our team than what happened to those individual kids that lost their life to the shooter, because that directly related, <clears throat> that incident directly related to our team, our players, and, uh, and, and our star player. Um, that, that was, you're talking about you're talking about having a hangover. Yeah, that, that really yeah. affected our our team for a long time because it took a long time for Cassius to come back from that, and fortunately he did, and we ended up winning the Big Ten. Um, and I thought, and if you remember, that was a COVID year, and I thought that going into the tournament, we were probably the hottest team in America, and we playing extremely well at that time. So yeah, no doubt it had an effect, but um, you know, we, <clears throat> I, I thought we, we, I thought we have went through a much more harsh tragedy um, when, when that happened in terms of our basketball team. I don't want people to get this wrong. In terms no, of our yeah, basketball absolutely. team, uh, that 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 tore us up. That tore us. Up. Yeah, because it wasn't it wasn't even just how it impacted Cassius, although that was massive. I mean, they all knew his brother, right? 
Oh, they were because the family close. was around all the time. Yeah, well, his brothers, both of them, went to Albion, which is right. You know, about forty-five minutes from us, and especially like during the summers, uh, both both Zach and Kai were on campus constantly. And not only did they spend time with Cassius, but they spent time with all of the guys on the right. team playing video games, working out in the gym together, eating together, you know, socializing together, uh, the whole deal. So, yeah, that, that <laughs> I mean, I, I remember the, the, that night like it was yesterday. So Michigan State now, two games left in the regular season and then the Big Ten tournament and then, of course, the NCAA tournament. How is uh how are practices different? How is the focus of your the Izzo's approach to the end of the season right now? I mean, obviously you want to win all these games, but I'm sure you're also building towards to try and prepare yourself for the one and done situation. You know, when it gets to both these postseason tournaments. Well, this this the, the game we played today had a had a uh, <clears throat> had a tournament you know atmosphere yeah. to it. it. It was like a tournament game. Uh, you know, I don't think, you know, I don't think you, with two games left, I don't think you, you know, just say, hey, we're, we're going to shut it down and, or we're just going to coast in and we're going to try to save it for the tournament. I don't believe that. And I know he's not going to do that. But <clears throat> um, I think your games, the games that you're playing now, because everybody is playing to get into the tournament, you have to perform well during those games. You can practice forever at this time of year, but your game performance is what shows, uh, what shows that you're gonna be able to do in, in, in those tough pressure situations during the tournament. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there. Uh, unfortunately, Michigan State falls 112-106 in overtime in Iowa City to a blistering hot Iowa team at the very end where they were, Michigan State was up 10 with just uh, under a minute to go. Uh, again, I'd like to remind you to support our show. You can go to the Final Four is on the schedule slash support, and you can find ways to support us with financial gifts. You can also go to uh, Final Four is on the schedule dot com slash merchandise, and there you can get uh, merchandise opportunities to uh, fund our show with through the purchase of t-shirts and sweatshirts and um, go to nudgeprinting.com final four for checkout for 20% off your order or go to uh, the brothers at just do gutters. If you want some gutter work, uh, cause it is spring coming up Michigan. It's the sloppy season. Make sure those things are working well for you. Uh, so until next time, the final four is on the schedule. Go green. Go white. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.